Welcome fellow wine lovers, this is the Wine Ghost Podcast. I'm Mate Bosch, a certified sommelier and seeker of hidden stories behind the most mysterious drink in history. For more information or direct contact, please look for the Wine Ghosts on Instagram and Facebook. But now, please grab a glass, get comfortable and listen to how the day's ghosts get out of the bottle. Today's ghost is Johannes Schellhorn, sommelier and the co-owner of the Freundschaft Wine Bar in Berlin. Johannes' philosophy about the duties of a sommelier tells you everything how open-minded it is when it comes to various gastronomic products. Quote, to think about everything you put in your mouth. Unquote. He also shared a drop of his widespread knowledge about fruit wines and his approach to natural wines. You will be introduced to the Berlin wine life and how the Freundschaft has found its place in its neighborhood. Just a glimpse, quote, in a city where people can go to nightclubs and dance naked for 48 hours, those are not the people who demand the classic Bordeaux, unquote. You can also learn strange beverage food pairings and some exciting tips how to use social media in the wine branch. I hope you find this episode as cool and loose as I have, and we can all enjoy a nice wine ghost on the front shelf terrace soon. Thank you, Johannes, for taking the time. Welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? Hi. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm stuck in quarantine, uh, but besides that, it's good. I'm cooking a lot, I'm drinking a lot, so uh, okay. now is the time to, to, to empty my cellar, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's, that's my job too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what are you drinking nowadays, actually? Uh, right now, I'm drinking a beer. To be honest, um, okay. It's uh, 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 It's by uh, it's my standard beer that I also serve in the bar. <laughs> At six p.m., it's uh, it's time for a little aperitif. Mm -hmm. Because you also are interested in ciders, right? In beers, in wines, in you know, all kinds of maybe funky stuff for for a lot of people. You yes, know, I would say I, I would say that comes with the definition of my profession. You know, if mm. you if you ask me what uh, what's the job of a sommelier, then my first answer would be to think about everything you put in your mouth. Mm. Uh, and this is very important because ever since you said it before when we, when we talked earlier that, that uh, becoming a sommelier is very fancy. Uh, these days, but this fanciness came together with this narrowing down only to the topic of wine. And because of narrowing down sommelier with wine or making it even worse, worse term is wine sommelier. That's why there's a beer sommelier, a cheese sommelier, and whatever, a water sommelier, which is ludicrous because that's all the, all together the job of a sommelier. And I come from a, um, I come originally from Austria, I live in Berlin and now, uh, and I come from the mountainous western part of Austria and uh, where I come from there are no, uh, there, there is no possibility to grow wine, but there are lots of other fruits which are funny to ferment or to make schnapps out of it or beer. So uh, what was your first encounter with, with wine? In, um, in, when, in around Salzburg, do you come from? Or yeah, yeah, uh, an hour south of Salzburg. My parents um, or my family does gastronomy for uh, I think seven generations, uh, and I grew up in a. I basically grew up in a in a hotel and restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. I think my first encounter was when I was uh, uh, when I got my first job uh, at my parents' place and had to polish uh, white glasses uh, when I was ten years old. Uh, as a as a summer job to earn a little money on the side, um, and then I always I don't know I I really had my 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 issues with gastronomy in general because you know it's a lot of work you work on weekends you work uh, late night um, and everything is very tough so after I finished school and I've been to tourism school as well in Salzburg and um, after I finished school. I went to California, um, I changed professions, I did, uh, I worked for a fashion label and after two years I had to come back because my, uh, because I couldn't get a new visa that easily 
And then I started to uh, study environmental e economics in cars, um, which was fun. But, you know, I've always been a very uh, lazy student. Uh, and I started to go to Southern Stereo, uh, to Südsteiermark on the weekends, especially to Kitzek with some friends. And we got, well, how should I say, how can I say it politely? We, we got very wasted uh, every other week. <laughs> wine um, and also good wines and I learned that I'm good in remembering tastes and remembering wines and compare wines with uh, especially wines with other wines I've tasted weeks earlier and mm. well uh, my my studies uh, at that day I was a little bit it was almost halfway through and I quit it and I started to do my sommelier education. And you also like try to develop these maybe blind tasting skills or tasting skills nowadays as well? Uh, a lot, you know, that's a, that's a good thing. I'm, uh, I'm, I opened my own wine bar and I didn't do it alone. Um, I did it with uh, with a fellow sommelier of mine, Willi Stögel, and that's always nice, you know, when you are two, it's very easy to challenge each other, and it's I think it's very important on the same on the same level to challenge each other, and we are uh, challenging each other on a regular basis, especially when it comes to uh, to buying wines for the wine list. Um, I totally trust Willi's opinion and he totally trusts mine but when we are really uh, uh, when we are really when we both are different opinions that we usually put all those wines you know get some sample bottles and, and, and taste it blindly and then see what's what's going on and what are you looking for in a in a wine actually if you want to take it on a list or not what what are your well, like preferences I, I like the the, the, the First and most important thing is that the product per se is good. Um, that means, especially when it comes to to a lot of uh, natural wines uh, lately, you know they seem a little bit odd, a little bit not necessarily faulty, but you know not like an, like accidentally okay. And I want when I'm looking for wine that I want to put on my list that I want the product to be. To be flawless and, and, and excellent, and flawless that does not mean uh, does not necessarily exclude volatile acidity, for example. But uh, but a flawless wine need to be unique and interesting, but not forced uh, to be interesting. But not made to be forced. Not but not made to be forced to to be interesting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the the first thing, and then the second thing is I like I always look up uh, the producer, and I know almost every producer I have on my list, um, on our list, and I want to I like I very much appreciate it when I get the uh, the, the the idea of the producer, you know what he wants to do, what he what he likes, what. With the producers drinking, it's a very, very important thing, you know. When I, when somebody likes to drink Mosel Cabinet Riesling and then uh, does on the same page, uh, uh, funky unfiltered uh, Pinot Noir uh, with no sulfur in it, uh, then that's that can be difficult. <laughs> and yeah, and then uh, if it's, uh, and then of course the uh, the the economical um, perspective can i afford it uh, can i uh, especially in times of allocation with uh, uh, with with rare wines what do i have to buy with it and, and all these things but they are basically completely normal i think and do you usually find that these attributes are correlating so if you maybe like the the winemaker or, or like his his or her approach to to drinking and to making wine then her, his or her final product is also better, maybe, or does it usually correlate? Usually, usually the system works out. You know, it's very, mm -hmm. a, a very interesting thing. Is I got it from a uh, 
from a winemaking friend of mine. And he's, uh, he, he works biodynamic and is very, you know, he's very strict in his opinion. And, he's, and I asked him, we had long talks uh, about uh, working organic and, and, and working Demeter and working biodynamic. And he said, you know, the easiest thing is not to look up any label. The easiest thing is to visit the producer. But before you ring the bell, look out for a trash can. <laughs> take a look, take a look in the in the in the household garbage. Because the household okay. garbage tells a lot about the person you're you're going to talk to. If somebody tells you that he that he uh, works organic and that he is uh, very in balance with nature, and then you look it up, and all you see is some plastic foil of some pre cutted cheese and sausage, then you kind of get a glimpse uh, how how the approach to the topic can be. Wow, that's, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting approach, but it's, yeah, it makes sense. I also sometimes get the feeling that, yeah, making natural wines or promoting biodynamic winemaking and also farming is getting more and more fashionable because I think it's a good uh, trend, but sometimes it's maybe overused or yeah, exactly. it's uh, I, I, just I, I, a marketing I totally, tool. I, I totally agree. I think that the, 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 the upside on, on natural wine is that never, the winemaking has never had such a young face. Uh, so all the guys who are do uh, most of the most of the people who are uh, who have talked about doing natural wine are in a very young age. There are lots of women involved, which is also, I think, really an important uh, an, an important thing. And the and also on the consumer side, um, it gets much younger than ten years ago. You know, wine was always this very, I don't know, the drink for old men before they go into the library and drink brandy uh, and now it's kind of it became fancy to pop a bottle and, uh, uh, and pour it and then talk about how nice it is that it's unfiltered you know what I mean it's so yeah. mm -hmm. that the whole the whole discussion about it changed a lot wine became sexy somehow right in the, in the last years <laughs> absolutely absolutely mm. and uh, and you know, in the beginning, you asked me about my approach to to, to ciders and beers because mm -hmm. that's the that's for me the, the best thing with natural wines that since they do not taste like wine as we knew it or as my my, my parents or my grandparents uh, know it, you're much more willing to play around with things you know um, there's a brewery in Belgium for example uh, Trifontaine and they do a very cool beer with uh, Belgium uh, with, with uh, Dornfelder grapes uh, from Belgium and they ferment Dornfelder red grapes with the sour beer mm -hmm. and they I think they, uh, they not even ferment they only macerate for 24 28 hours or 30 hours and this tastes like a really Good, slightly on the bottle, re-fermented Dornfelder. <laughs> oh, that's the interesting. Beer, the, beer part, the beer part is gone. And uh, with, with, apples, uh, with apple ciders uh, and very low intervention Riesling, it's kind of similar approach. But it's this story about the Dornfelder. What, what, how does it change the aromas? It re-fermented does Goese. So Goese is a, a spontaneous ferment, a, a spontaneous cask fermented, Sour beer, uh, um, only allowed to be called Goese when it's made in, in Bercel, so south of Brussels. Uh, so you have Bretonomyces in the beer, that's how it gets sour. Um, you have a little bit CO2, but not so much because cask fermented and spontaneous fermented. And then you add a red juice, a red grape juice, and it automatically gets this what we know from, I don't know, from maybe good Lambrusco or, or good red pet nuts. Um, because obviously in, in natural, since, since we all appreciate to drink natural wine, we learn to appreciate better and we learn to appreciate 
slightly a slight tingle through a refermentation of the bottle, and that opened that opened uh, the, the palates uh, the palates of consumers a lot. And that also sounds like a, a good basis for an interesting wine pairing in a wine bar, or exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, especially in in Berlin. Um, Every other year, uh, the raw wine fair um, comes to Berlin, and uh, that's always a good tool to to excite people who know everything, who drinks, who who drink everything because they are in because they go to Paris, because they go to to London, uh, because they like to hang in LA. I don't know, and then you serve a cider from I don't know. Odin style, which is grown on the same soil uh, as their Riesling, um, which is uh, made in the cellar in a very similar way uh, as they approach uh, their wines. The fun thing is always by not telling them that it's not wine. You know, leave it in the dark. It's a very unexpected, it's a, a, a very unexpected, unknown pleasure, I would say. And what's people's usual reaction like? Yeah, I would say the majority, the, the, the vast majority is very positive about it. And in a restaurant, maybe, or in a wine bar, like, wh where do you see the the rule of these kind of uh, drinks in in a conventional, so to say, restaurant or wine bar? Uh, I think I think it it's, it de always depends on the vibe of the of the place. So I worked before uh, in, a, in a Michelin star restaurant in Berlin at Nobelhart and Schmutzig, and we always um, try to involve uh, at least one beer and one fruit wine uh, in the pairing. And if the pairing are eight or eight, uh, seven drinks, and you have two out of seven were not wine, um, that's always fun. And the, the the big upside as well is the is the lower alcohol, and that's a thing we always uh, or we oftenly we sommeliers oftenly forget that uh, too much is not always it's not always good. Uh, and when you have a fruit wine, um, then it's always a little bit. It always it smoothens out, it smooths out uh, the temper of the evening. And what other kind of fruit wines would would you recommend, maybe for a, which are not too um, <laughs> strange, so to say, but uh, maybe more approachable for for an everyday consumer? What what are your favorites, well, maybe? Uh, well, you know. In, in, in Germany, everybody is crazy about rhubarb. Uh, mm -hmm. During rhubarb season, you see rhubarb everywhere. Um, there is an, uh, an amazing producer in Estonia, uh, south of Tallinn, uh, and they do a rhubarb sparkling wine, which is, if it, has, it has a harsh acidity, I, I have to admit, as rhubarb always, uh, always has, but tastes unbelievably good. Low alcohol, High in acidity, perfect for uh, for an early summer eve. Um, and then uh, also product which is very underestimated with fruit wines is quince. Um, there is a, a winemaker from uh, uh, from Franconia, Steffen Vetter. Uh, he does a fabulous spontaneous fermented quince pet nut. Uh, so Todo Oral, awesome, awesome stuff. Um, you know, because quince is always a tiny little bit more tannic, I would say, and uh, it's great to play with and to, to play along with, uh, and also great to pair with. You know, um, if you pair a quince cider um, with a milky, uh, with a milky, uh, with milky ice cream, for example, it blows your mind. <laughs> Or also on the same page. If it's a very tannic one, you can uh, uh, you can also serve it to, to pork meat. It's always a, a thing I always, I always like and I always like to pair with. Um, and uh, well, of course, if it comes to the to the classic stuff, there's also there are also really good young and new uh, cider producers. There's one from. You see it. Uh, uh, you see it a lot lately. Uh, see the Volcan, Jacques Peritas, from Central Switz uh, from from Southwest Switz uh, Southwest uh, Switzerland. Um, does amazing uh, natural 
uh, natural ciders and and, and porés, so pear cider, and also I think also quince. Maybe. And there's another one. Uh, now that I think about it, for all the port wine lovers out there, um, Frederikstal, um from Denmark, from uh, Lolland, and they make uh, a cherry wine which is fortified. Uh, lasts when it's open for quite a while, but usually you know it's small bottles, it's half bottles, so you can have it for a party of two with a dessert on a cozy on a cozy evening. Hmm. That all sounds very interesting, and it sounds like it's also expand uh, the limit of, of sourcing wines or sourcing uh, drinks out in terms of lands, right, or in terms of in terms of countries. Both, and it's very important, you know, also for the uh, also for the producer side. You know, wine wine growing is the best example for uh, for how to elevate the price of a product. Nobody would pay for uh, for a handful of grape more than I don't know one or two euros but for a bottle of wine it's easy to raise 10 euros minimum and it goes up to uh, a few thousand bucks if it's grown on the right soil uh, but all the fruit producers uh, they sell their fruit for uh, uh, for the lowest prices and it's always the lower the better and the cheaper the better but the second you start to 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 ferment it, and the, sec- the second you start to think about a, a nice fancy label, and think about a, a, a good looking bottle, and if you see it as a as a product, it elevates the price of uh, of the same amount of fruit in an accelerating level. And how do you look for these producers? Mm. Well, first of all, my, my first contacts um, with uh, uh, with fruit stuff was when I was 15. You know, in my area, lots of people do do schnapps, and so first got my, my first little alcohol endeavor was with most, so with uh, mashed and 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 fermenting apples, um, and it's very gross and it's a very uh, you feel very, uh, very sick the next two days, um, and then I was done with this topic for a long time. And when I started to to work with wine, I uh, in my sommelier education, I started to ferment apples in my in my basement. Um, was also I have to say I'm a better sommelier than a than a food wine maker. Then I started to work with Instagram and Facebook actually a lot. Uh, I searched for producers on Facebook. I searched for, I searched in different wine forums. Um, a few friends of mine they went to wine schools uh, in Kloster Neuburg and in uh, and in Geisenheim in Germany. And then you get a sense for what people are doing very very fast because it's not such a big market out there. Or it was not such a big market out there back then. Um, and then it got bigger and bigger. And when I started at Noble Heart and Schmutzig, um, uh, Billy Wagner uh, had a really big, big, big focus on it, and that uh, accelerated my knowledge and my, my focus on, on, on natural wines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I always kept it going. You know, it was like this. It was like this odd hobby you have on top of an odd hobby. Yeah, and then it became interesting for other people. Like you. <laughs> <laughs> how do you see the Berlin wine life, maybe, or how do you see the your guests? Are are they getting excited to see these new trends? Or uh, Berlin is a very uh, Berlin is a very very open-minded city. Obviously, in a city where people can go to nightclubs uh, and dance naked uh, for forty-eight hours, those are not the customers who demand classically Bordeaux. Uh, but on the same page, Berlin is a very young wine market. Of, uh, also, gastronomy-wise, in a very and it's develop, it's still developing and still it slowly finds itself. Uh, there are a couple of places where you can drink good wines, where you can drink good natural wines. It's mostly restaurants, but also there are one or two wine bars. Um, most of them are very French influenced, and that's also how the Berlin market works, maybe. 
but of course, you know, I don't want to do the same thing as my as my neighbor wine bar does or the, the, the restaurant across the street. I want to develop something unique. I want to develop a, 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 a unique selling point. Tell me, or tell me, tell us about Freundschaft a little bit uh, and what's, yes. what's the face of this place? Yes, so Freundschaft, um, my partner, uh, I was in Sommelier at Nobelhart and Schmutzig, as I said before. Uh, my partner, Willi Schlögel, was... Um, Uh, I was the, the, the manager and uh, uh, wine director of uh, Cordoba, um, also wine bar in Berlin, but, uh, but mostly with Austrian and German wines. And I met Willy when I started in Berlin, so he's from Austria as well, but we've never met before. And we got along very well. We met oftenly after work for a few beers or bottles of wines or both. Um, and you know how it is when two guys in, who do in gastronomy uh, are coming together drinking, you always start with, someday we open a thing together. Yeah, yeah, someday <laughs> we open a thing together. And uh, it happens. And it happens. Um, so we are located in the in Berlin Mitte. Um, Mitte is not the center of Berlin. It's um, close to Brandenburger Tor. Uh, And after the Berlin Wall came down, it's a very underdeveloped uh, area. So it's not a residential area. It is very developed, but not in a residential way. Um, we don't have any neighbors. We're in a very quiet place. But this gives a lot of opportunity. You know, we usually have, we don't have problems with neighbors because there, mm -hmm. are, there, 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 there aren't such. We can play music as long as we want, as loud hmm. as we want. Um, and we rented this place it's a it's a one room bar basically with a 35 uh, meter uh, counter uh, and a small table for uh, 14 people max um, you know which we use for tastings or if there's uh, a, a smaller party or something uh, we appreciate the table and they sit there And if you could maybe summarize the vibe of the place in, in one sentence, what, how would you say that? Or why should Berlin tourists visit your place? What's the vibe? Um, well, basically the vibe, the vibe is very, it's very open. It's very communicative. It's uh, uh, crowdy, but not, in a, but not in a bad way. And it's very, uh, we ap approach the topic of wine in a very, easy way you know you get a nice glass of wine and a nice glass if you want to talk about it we can talk about it uh if you want me to uh, to to tell you how to be pretentious about it i can do that but otherwise you can drink your wine you can drink your glass or bottle of wine have uh, a few uh, cold and warm uh, uh dishes of bar food uh, out of the kitchen and have a nice evening and that's what's that's what's the most important thing is at the place you know creating uh, uh creating a space where everybody can enjoy himself so it's it's also kind of a neighborhood meeting place or uh yeah especially you know for for all the after work people so we are mm -hmm. um above us there's the, the there's a big german newspaper uh and there are a couple of law firms close by and It's uh, we also they, we also open only from Monday to Friday. We are closed on Saturdays and Sundays, um, usually. And yeah, that's that's easy. And we have a huge outside area during summer, which is always nice um, to hang with. Uh, and especially for Berlin tourists, you know, it's uh, it's pretty cool to combine with uh, with some sightseeing things. You know, go through uh, go through Brandenburger Tor and then come for for uh, then come for an easy dinner. Yeah, please do it. I will put the address in the description. So oh, th thank you very much. You. And in general, what 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 do you think is the rule of a wine bar in a, in a modern yeah maybe society is a bit too big, but in a modern city or neighborhood, do you what what do you see? Because it's not a restaurant, it's not a kneipe. So what where where would you put a wine bar in? In society and what what are the base customers i'm not sure if it's i think a wine bar is exactly in the middle of restaurant and kneipe mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and uh, I, i would put it in 
that term that it's, uh, you know, the earlier the evening, the more important the food topic is. So the more it's this casual, casual restaurant thing. Uh, and the later the evening gets, the, the more, in, in, in the best way, the more it turns to a kneipe. So, um, so it's I, like a transition. I, exactly, <laughs> it's very it's, it's, mm. it's like this this this, this uh, chameleon, uh, chameleon style of gastronomy. Mm. You know, I always uh, I always hate it when I'm in a uh, in, in some place and when I'm drinking wine and then they close at eleven or make last round at at at, at midnight. You know, I like to get there at seven, get some food, and then start to drink and if i want to if i want to drink till 3 a.m in the morning if it's still crowded why stop it yeah keep it going so usually we open we, we close it to uh to those so 3 a.m was a little bit over the top but um the most important thing is that there is not this there's not this rule of me you gotta get the you gotta uh, get the fuck out of here when the yeah, club strikes yeah. midnight yeah true <laughs> And what is your food concept, if I may ask? So, what what are you serving mostly in the So, uh, there are a couple of dishes we serve. Uh, we serve all night long. Um, it's like uh, uh, you know some uh, delicacies, uh, uh, like a very good cheese selection uh, from Maitre Philippe from Berlin, or we always have some ham from. Uh, from a butchery in Vienna, uh, they are very famous for uh, uh, for the cooked Beinschinken, is the German term, so ham from mm-hmm. from the nest, uh, um, and some some sardines. Uh, but beside that, uh, in semi modern approach of, of 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 classical dishes. So, uh, for example, we always play around. Uh, we play around with different variations of, uh, of beef satire. We always have uh, a stew um, uh, uh, on the menu. Um, or some snails with, uh, uh, with a little bit garlic butter. And you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that. So comfy mm-hmm. food, which, which is fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and screams for good wine pairings, I guess. Exactly. And do, do people appreciate or do people ask for for specific wine pairings or how do how do you do maybe the daily menus or how do you do you do an instant pairing always or uh no usually i uh i have in between or we have in between uh 15 15 to i don't know 20 to 35 wines by the glass open we don't use car bar because i think that's it's it's a little bit weird, you know. Carver is like it's like watching uh, watching you porn. It's, it, it gets it gets you to the it gets you to the goal, but it's not the same as having real sex. And I try to pair it if um, if uh, the, the the guest is uh, if the guests are asking for it. Um, and yeah, and uh, I always have something that that matches up uh, very well. How often do you change these? Uh wines per glass well one standard thing it's 15 wines um white and reds and some sparkling which i always have and i change those when i'm running out of it so i'm buying 16 bottles here 60 bottles here uh, 90 bottles there 48 bottles and so on and whenever they run out then i then i change this uh, this certain position um but if you come and uh, sit in and say, you know, I I heard of your place, I would like to drink young Austrian producers, it's possible by the glass, then I'm uh, very eager to open bottles, you know, it's, mm-hmm. that's a good thing, it's, uh, since it's, uh, as I mentioned before, one bar, um, you have everything inside very well, uh, and you can sell those freshly opened bottles perfectly because the one who sits next to you sees that i opened the bottle especially for you you know in best case scenario uh, he uh, looks over his shoulder and says oh can i try this as well yeah and that's why i i actually asked earlier like where do you see the 
the rule of a wine bar of, uh, in the modern maybe wine industry because it, the wine bar I think or at least in my eyes should be really this bridge between the customers and the wine maker or the winery right it plays a very in, 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 in a consistent way and you yeah. know and also uh, and also if if we go back to that scenario I described before and if you say well yes uh, but I don't like this because it tastes like this and that. Uh, then, you know, I couldn't be more happy uh, to find something that works. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because that's also that's also how I how I see how I see my job. Uh, uh, it's often really like a puzzle, and uh, you know, you have to uh, as a sommelier, you have to ask the right questions in advance, and if you ask the right questions. It's easy to find the, the right answer. And maybe in the restaurant settings, you may not have enough time to, to no, solve I, the I puzzles. Totally, I, I, I totally, I totally disagree. I think in the restaurant, uh, it's it's the uh, it's the other way around. Usually in the restaurant, uh, you have more time, um, more time to talk about it, and more time to uh, more time to work with your guests as well. You know in in general, generally speaking, when you go to a restaurant, you sit there for at least one and a half, two hours. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you a lot of talking time and a lot of time of not only talking, but time of, of, of interaction. Um, and that's a little bit different in the, in, 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 in the, in the wine bar life. Uh, not necessarily, but usually it can be different. Uh, I think that one of the most problematic things in our society is that people are scared of asking too much questions. Instead of asking and in, in a kind way and kind manner to find out what the what the what the uh, what the opposite likes and wants, there's a lot of guessing involved, and I hate to guess. Yeah. And, uh, the asking part is important because usually, especially when it's a party of uh, of two or three or four, um, by asking you find out very, very fast that they uh, do not, that they have very different opinions. Uh, but I only want to 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 make you happy, and that's only it's only uh, uh, it's the, the obstacle is again communication, and maybe time, <laughs> so, yeah, and time. You know, you always you always need to. Uh, uh, but that's the thing I I really appreciate this job. Uh, you have to find solutions under under high pressure. And in terms, if you talk about wine communication, or maybe not only in the restaurant, but you told me earlier that you use, uh, you don't really have an official website, but you use, and you uh, are yes, very we, active we, on. Uh, we, we have we have an official website, but we don't have, uh, but we don't have any uh, any good Google. Google okay. Links, you know? Okay. <laughs> so customers or listeners should uh, rather go to your social media, right? Exactly. <laughs> and uh, how do you use it, or how do you prefer um, leveraging on social media? What's your maybe approach, or is it more like an instinct, or do you have maybe like a stricter principles? Um, that's very interesting. I have on my. Um... Uh, on my personal uh, Instagram account, I follow a very strict principle. Um, so I post either wine bottles or uh, or a selfie. You know, selfies are always good because they they gain traffic, um, and it, it, and it follows a certain pattern. Uh, on the uh, professional sides um, or on the on the uh, bar Freundschaft side, it's a tiny little bit different. Um, also, because Willi is is posting, I am posting, um, and it follows. A, I would call it a semi pattern. You know, when we don't try to, we try not to over penetrate, uh, uh, over penetrate our viewers with uh, boring wine bottles or with too many food content, um, but also put me and him uh, uh, in the focus because that's where people are coming uh, because they know that, uh, that they're only talking to, to pros um, but to keep it leveled out I, I would say you know I have a dog sometimes I post a picture of my dog sitting on some wine boxes that's always good for content uh, good for traffic 
Um, and yeah, basically it's social media. So the more authentic it gets, the better. So you kind of mix the profession with the person, all right? Exactly. And do you, what do you see the most, <laughs> yeah, interactions or what, what, what do you think people would like to see from a sommelier or from a wine bar posting on social media? I think it's uh, very important to see what's, what's going on. So what's the new hottest, uh, what's the new hottest shit? Uh, what are the guys, uh, what are the guys serving? What are the guys doing? Um, on the same page, you can advertise, uh, uh, you can advertise tastings very well. Um, and also what's, what's going on, you know, to stay on, um, to stay on people's minds. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when, when you see our Instagram page, you see, uh, 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 you see me and Willy drinking a lot and, uh, uh, and doing some stuff because you don't, you, you can't taste the wine on, on, on Instagram, uh, and you, and it's, uh, and it does not make any sense to recreate the whole setting in your living room. You know, that's what we all doing, uh, doing right now during Corona crisis. We try to, 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 to recreate wine bar settings, uh, or, or restaurant settings, uh, with our families and, uh, uh, it bores everyone, uh, after, uh, after a couple of days. So uh, you want to uh, get a glimpse why we are cool guys and why, uh, and you want to get the idea of why it's fun to go there. Mm. Hmm. So it's more like a community, what you're trying exactly. to do, right? Exactly. In terms of not maybe, maybe not meaning only social media, but where do you see the, the rule of a, of a sommelier or where do you see the rule of the communication of a sommelier, maybe not only on, on social media, but maybe on personal blogs about wine, about wine traveling, because back, back in the day before social media, you could only buy some magazines like Decanter or Fine Wine, and then you read about places and it was very advertising driven, right? But now yeah. we have, but now we have maybe more individual faces and more respected sommeliers who can maybe drive traffic to a, to lesser known grape varieties or lesser known producers, which is, which could be very interesting. Do you, or where do you see this trend is going and where do you see the role of a sommelier in this, in this new setting? Well, I think this is, this is, uh, one of the best parts in, uh, uh, with the whole development of social media, you know, nobody reads, uh, nobody I know, uh, reads, uh, uh fine wine magazine or decanter anymore, uh, because they, are made for a different generation of, of, of wine drinkers. Uh, and also when you are not a professional and you try to read the Canter magazine, it's uh, for the Canter magazine, for example, obviously, um, it gets very complex and very difficult to read. Uh, and when a sommelier, uh, um, when you're every day uh, uh, in town sommelier, uh, is posting about a wine travel, um, uh, for example, then it gets very accessible. You know, you can, in the best case scenario is to, uh, to see why it could be fun going to, I don't know, Georgia and go to, to Sagarejo, uh, and be uh, this very rural area of very far Eastern Europe. Um, because the people there seem nice and because they, most of them are doing it on a, they're just documenting, and that's at least what I do. I document my, 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 my leisure time. You know, I don't get any, I don't get any money of it. I don't get, get any, I don't have any financial, uh, financial interests to, to push an area. So the, uh, authentic, uh, authenticity is, uh, is much, Higher. Mm. 
yeah and uh, via social media or via the internet you you also get more platform right because before that you have to <laughs> maybe get to know the the editor or you have you have to send your resume to the to the editor Absolutely. of the magazine and get Absolutely. your place there. Yeah. Nice. It's uh, do you, do you have any people or international people who you follow on social media if you want to learn more about rare things or fashionable things? Oh, mind I'm, I'm happy to. So um, <laughs> I, I can send you a list after this. You can post it in it. But uh, for example, Marco Kovac is great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, especially when it comes to uh, to natural wines or uh, uh, Sebastian Georgi uh, is also um, also very good on Instagram. It's a former sommelier uh, from a, he worked in a free Michelin star place in Germany and then he opened a, a pizzeria with very nice wines in Düsseldorf in Cologne um, uh, on a more international scale. It's for example, let me look it up quickly. I was not I was Bra not prepared for this question. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. It was just, um, just came out. Brian McClintic, for example, I, I really much yeah, like uh, yeah, Brian, Brian McClintic. But Brian McClintic, for example, uses this very clever as well because he is a wine distributor. Yeah. Uh, and he uses social media perfectly uh, to, dis to uh, distribute to distribute his stuff. It's actually um, good that you good that you mentioned it because that's the that's a blueprint of how you should do it, how you should create a, a, a create a semi business selling platform. Awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a very but, nice but, guy. Or Raj Park or something. They're very much the same. Yeah. Because it's not pushy, right? It's authentic. It's it doesn't sound like an advertisement. Exactly. <laughs> but it kinda it says, is. It says, it says authenticity but uh, uh, if you look it up what he is importing to the to the to, to the west coast in the united states it's exactly those things he is uh, he said yeah and you know those things like michael saga is, is uh, very much the same and yeah that's that's fun and also there's another guy i've never met in person uh which i like a lot it's uh, i think somebody from mugaritz uh i think it's an uh, instagram he's called mohammed sommelier uh, great champagne lover, good taste. <laughs> Maybe just some personal stuff. But do you have any like favorite food wine pairings? What you could share? Maybe also a bit like like not the typical stuff, but maybe what your favorite well, I, is. I, I I love to have a to have a very ripe uh, a very ripe piece of Stilton or you know good blue cheese in a in a ripe stage with uh, warm Coca Cola. Okay. It's actually wow. amazing. That... But the Coca-Cola is warm. It does not work. It's the best, uh -huh. it's also the best example uh, uh, to show what temperature what temperature does to a drink. Hmm. Wow, that's surprising, yes. <laughs> and in terms of wine pairing? <laughs> um, in terms of wine pairing, I would say you have to pick one. How, how many can I pick? Yeah, uh, Let's say two. Let's say two. Um, I like to drink um, Chenin Blanc from Loire Valley. Uh, you know, very fancy at the moment. And if you have a Chenin Blanc with a little bit uh, more in the direction to to Savonnier, with uh, very slow cooked uh, or maybe sous vide cooked. Uh, uh, piece of fatty fatty fish like salmon or salmon trout um, that gives a lot of buttery flavors and then the combination with the Chenin Blanc and the acidity of the Chenin Blanc it's just boom like um, if you want me to pick a Chenin uh, then I would say dun, dun, dun. La Lune from uh, La Femme de la Saisonniere from uh, Marc Angelique great winery by the way it's also right. a, a little sulfur tiny little bit of residual sugar and that's just uh, amazingly good uh, and the other thing is I love uh, venison um, and venison you know especially a saddle of venison 
um, pink in the middle, and then you serve it with uh, old school German Riesling, mm. old Spätleser from the 80s or the early 90s. Uh, especially Mosel and Ruber works uh, works very good with it. Saar obviously has a tiny little bit too much acidity to it, but um, uh, that's unbelievably good. I had a Kartäuserhof, uh, Kartäuserhof Spätlese 89 the other day with venison. Uh, that was uh, delish. Hmm. Wow, that's uh, before dinner, that is, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. just... <laughs> And do you have maybe favorite places or favorite terroirs? Where would where would you like to go if you could go to one place or if you should pick your favorite um, emerging okay. place? Well, uh, since I'm from Austria, I think the the, the, the the area I've traveled most is maybe Wachau. It's not necessarily the style of wine I appreciate the most, but it's the most beautiful, beautiful place internationally. Uh, I love uh, uh, I love Piemonte, mm. and I love the Piemont um, because of the cuisine. I love it because of their their approach to wine, and uh, you know there are no big wine factories there. Everything is very is still very old school, very rural. It's old guys doing old school style of wines. Um, that's what I what I really appreciate um and i really like georgia as i mentioned before that's why maybe why I'm, i mentioned uh uh Kaketi valley because that's that's fun to go there yeah sounds like a good list i i could sign up right now if this coronavirus would <laughs> would finally be over how do you actually see the this situation or this outbreak, what which effects do you think it's going to have on, on, on the business? Well, the longer it lasts, um, the less places will be there after it's over. There are a lot of places which were struggling, uh, which were struggling uh, in the past, that they will simply have to shut down, or are forced to shut down. And, you know, others will come and the whole, the whole, the whole industry will change necessarily. Nobody's. I, I can't believe that anyone uh, that anybody is going on a summer holiday this year. Mm -hmm. You know, not only because Italy is uh, Italy is shut down, but also because uh, you know schools are closed. I think that there won't be any long school holidays. Yeah. Um, so that will be a very very interesting. Interesting to see the second this nightmare hopefully is uh, soon soonish over. But I think you can already spot some new trends, maybe with this online tastings, for example, or maybe more direct or or the online. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. But, but but again, you know, I, I I used this this metaphor before, but in the end, it's like you know watching you porn. It, it's very synthetic and it, it helps, you know, in times of uh, in times of crisis. Um, but it's I not totally the same. Agree, but I, I see the more educational side of it because I see a lot of uh, winemaker, for example, Armin, who who we already talked about uh, before. Like they also they are also doing online tastings. But I think it you can also order the wine, for example. Sure, they, sure, you know, absolutely. Taste it at yeah, home, and that's sure. less like like watching a porn. And on the other <laughs> side, that. On the other side, that they are talking about their wines, you know, and they exactly. are explaining how it's made, and it's it's never really existed before, or exactly. it's, get, it was get, very rare. You get you get more in that focus. That's true. Yeah, I, I think you know it it all it all stands or falls um, with the timing. Yeah. So yeah. the 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 longer the longer it lasts, um, the more difficult it's 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 going to be for all of us. And where do you yeah. see your future if, if everything goes all right? Well, if everything goes all right, then, uh, then I do a uh, summer service uh, in hot and dry Berlin weather. Um, <laughs> there was, uh, I mentioned before, you know, that I came from a gastronomy, from a gastronomy background, but I'm, I'm very lucky that I have a younger brother and a younger sister 
And when I decided not to take over the family place, uh, my brother said he would. So uh, when I uh, started my own enterprise, I also asked my question where I will be in five years. And if the answer uh, wouldn't have been Berlin, then I would be uh, somewhere else by now. So good luck with it. Thank you really much for your time, Johannes. Thank you. It was very nice talking to you. And uh, yeah, next time you come to Berlin, let me know. Uh, then we're going to share a bottle of wine. Sure, yeah, for sure. I'm going to bring some Hungarian wines, maybe, from my favorite awesome. producers. <laughs> okay, okay, let it be. Thank you very much, Johannes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.